Okay guys, this is the attention disorders lecture, so pretty much focusing on ADD and some of the medications used to treat that uh, specific group of disorders. So there's two kind of ways to say it, ADD or ADHD. I think both are pretty much used interchangeably in you know, general conversations, um, but the medical term, the more appropriate term, is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD. So this is the one we're going to be talking about treating today. Um, the the origin of this is is was originally thought to be mostly a pediatric disease, and that's still you know where we see a lot of it. However, um, there are a lot of adults that suffer from ADHD too, and it can be a, a symptom that goes hand in hand with depression a lot of the time, um, and it can also affect uh, a number of uh, facets of daily living. I think adults generally, over time, who have ADHD, tend to develop strategies for. Uh, coping with the different difficulties of the illness better than you know a child who ne doesn't necessarily have the life experience to understand how to cope with um, some of these things that are occurring to them so, or happening to them. So in this case, um, I think adults probably don't present with it very often and um, might not necessarily be aware of that they have you know a, a disease or an issue, a mental illness, um, whereas children, because their parents see it or you know teachers observe the behavior and they just they might act out more so on it, like with more aggressive behavior. Uh, they can uh, just be, uh, it's more visible. I think it presents and the, the symptoms of the, the illness present much more um, uh, aggressively and, and, and upfront than with adults who may suppress some of them or may find mitigation strategies to avoid them. But really, I mean, the terms are basically interchangeable. So we're really talking about the same thing here. Okay, so the, the physiologic background behind um, attention deficit disorders are uh, uh, the idea that there's some sort of a catecholamine imbalance. So very similar to what we suspect for a lot of different mental illnesses, right? Most of the things, there's some sort of dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine imbalance. So really, when we're talking about neurotransmitters, we're usually manipulating one of those three or maybe all of those three. And in this case, it's usually thought that there's some sort of a dopamine norepinephrine uh, miscommunication with certain symptoms, uh, certain um, areas of the brain, specifically within the cerebral cortex. So it's been hypothesized that you have an increase in dopamine transporter density. So your body's clearing dopamine too quickly from the synapse. Um, also, the serotonin might play some kind of a role, but we aren't 100% sure if that's uh, linked totally to, to ADD, or maybe that's a side effect of having ADD, that maybe there's some serotonin kind of aftermath that happens that imbalances certain areas of the brain. Um, and then clinical manifestations, poor concentration, distractibility, elevated motor activity, impulsivity, disinhibition, those are kind of the things that people probably associate very strongly with attention deficit. Um, and to be diagnosed with it, the feature needs to disrupt two domains of daily life. So um, you have to have school or work if you're an adult um, and family and peer relationships. So what we see sometimes is where people have maybe, again, figured out ways to cope with, with having ADD. So maybe they actually um, study really well in school, but you know their family life or their peer-to-peer -peer relationships suffer as well. So it's kind of looking at two different areas of life uh, and, and seeing if there's some consistent behavior patterns there. Uh, other problems we might see, poor self-regulation, so difficulty with goal-directed thought or action. Um, deficits may become more apparent late adolescence and early adulthood as responsibility increases. So as you get more responsibility as an adult, more things that you have to you actually do, you have to show up to work, you have to get projects done, you have deadlines to meet, where in school things aren't necessarily as strict in certain aspects of life. Those can, um, that can manifest more intense uh, uh, aspects of the illnesses, uh, disability in, in the adult or the young adult. Um, hyperactive component. So uh, we don't see hyperactivity really in adults. It's very, very much the childhood manifestation of the illness. And usually, um, uh, you know, the child hyperactivity, that's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, but in adults, you may see it manifest as more of a, a difficulty in relaxing, or the, the patient may say that they feel on edge all the time, kind of like anxiety almost, but not quite the same thing. Um, disorganization, so socially, professionally, difficulty prioritizing things, and uh, learning disabilities too. So somebody has a history of learning disability or... Um, 
uh, you know, whether it was diagnosed or, or, or not, you know, that's something to think about as well. So treatment, um, pharmacotherapy is first line. So uh, the with attention deficit, you're usually you could you can definitely incorporate psychotherapy. However, um, uh, it's not necessarily as helpful as um, pharmacotherapy for actually managing the day-to-day -day symptoms. So if there are problematic behaviors specifically uh, that may have been developed in, in in you know in response to having the the illness, whether they be coping behaviors or behaviors associated with you know the, the actual attention deficit problems, you can possibly restore or change those. However, it's very difficult to um, change the underlying pathophysiology of the disease. So a lot of times, pharmacotherapy is sort of the the only thing we can do. Um, so with a couple different medications, um, work on a few different pathways, and most of them have to do with norepinephrine. So um, the norepinephrine pathway is probably the best at treating ADHD, and we'll talk about two strategies to do this. Um, the first one being stimulants, which are the mainstay uh, for children and adults. So um, our, our stimulant drugs are, of course, quite popular, and that's um, the, the primary area of their use is for uh, attention deficit disorders. Okay, stimulant medications are the, the major drugs we're going to talk about, and they stimulate release of catecholamines from different storage sites within the central nervous system. So basically, what they're going to do is force a neuron to release more norepinephrine and dopamine, and so you're going to get an increased concentration in various areas of the brain, including uh, the, the midbrain and frontal cortex, areas where they think that uh, uh, there'd be more that they think are associated more with with um, the attention deficit issues because of the way the drugs work. So the drugs seem to have a good effect on patients who take them. So again, it's kind of like depression where we talk about um, the, the serotonin medications being effective for depression. Therefore, depression must have some sort of a serotonin pathophysiology, right? It's very similar here. They're pretty safe drugs overall, actually. I think stimulants get a pretty bad rap, and we'll talk about uh, a number of reasons why that is, but overall they're pretty well tolerated. Um, you have, uh, you know, caution to, for use in a number of cases. Specifically, if somebody is a substance abuser, has a history of abuse, that'd be somebody to, to be careful with the stimulant in. Uh, and um, as far as efficacy goes, you do have more evidence to show that children respond better than adults with adults. They, there's other strategies we can try. They don't always respond all that well to stimulants, whereas children pretty much first line and usually very good response. Uh, clinically shown to improve daily living skills, which is pretty much our, our goal of therapy here. Um, there's a ton of stimulants on the market and there's not really any difference in efficacy between any of them. And they all show pretty good short-term benefits, but the evidence for long-term use is questionable. We don't really know if there's uh, uh, long-term how these people are functioning, like if they're taking these medications chronically for, you know, over several years. But short-term trials do show pretty good benefits. So I'm going to talk about a few different types of stimulants. Methylphenidate is the first one. Uh, so methylphenidate is one of the older stimulants and still widely used today. It's got a lot of different formulations, just like all the stimulants do. And um, I've kind of broken them up into the different brand names. I'm not going to test you on the differences here. I don't really care that you know them, but I would just be somewhat familiar with the the idea that you can mix and match a lot of these formulations to tailor a specific regimen to a patient uh, very well. So like an example would be maybe you have a patient who takes a long-acting medication in the morning. So maybe they get up and they take a Ritalin long-acting or Concerta. And then um, in the afternoon, if that drug's wearing off, they might take maybe some short acting to, to get them through. The idea is that you don't have a lot of drug in the system when you're trying to get to bed, especially for kids uh, who need to sleep. And well, adults need to sleep too, but <laughs> sleep is, uh, kids tend to sleep much longer than, than adults and, and need more sleep, especially younger children. And it's important that you don't, you know, overstimulate too much. So it's really a fine balance in finding these medications that are going to work well but also not keep the patient up at night. So that's probably going to be the biggest side effect, of course, of a stimulant. Um, you can see I've listed a number of different products here. Like there's everything from there's patches, 
Um, there's a oral liquid suspension. It's actually an extended release formulated to, to be taken as a liquid. So for kids who don't want to take tablets, that's an option. And there's all kinds of interesting delivery strategies. So I've got Concerta over here, which is a, a specific brand of methylphenidate. Um, and, and this one comes as a generic too, but just to show you kind of the differences. So there's like a Ritalin long acting, which is a long acting methylphenidate. There's also Concerta, which is an extended release methylphenidate, and they are different. So Concerta has this kind of shell like this, it looks sort of like this white thing I've got up here, this white pill, and it has a capsule like layer like that. And what happens is it's osmotic, so the water can cross that capsule barrier without actually breaking it down. And um, there's a tiny hole on one side of it. And so as the water gets into it, it'll slowly push it out. And the drug's designed that um, the, the drug, or the, the whole product, I should say, is designed so that the drug will push out quickly initially because this is very soluble. And then um, the more dense drug will kind of phase out or uh, diffuse out over time. And what you get is a nice extended release mechanism there. It's kind of an interesting, unique uh, delivery mechanism. It's not used all that much. Um, and Concerta is kind of one of the only drugs that does it. The interesting thing is, is that these capsules are not actually um, dissolved fully. So people will find them in their stool. Uh, that's a point if somebody, you know, you ever hear that somebody says, well, I, I don't think it's working because I'm just seeing them, you know, when I have a bowel movement. Well, that's because the drug all diffused out and you're just really seeing an empty shell of the medication. Um, just to compare kinetics, because that's really the big deal here. Remember, all these are essentially the same. Methylphenidate's methylphenidate. It's just how you're going to get it into the patient and how long do you want it to be available for. So usually, again, we're, we want the drug out um, after a certain amount of time. So you know, if somebody takes a drug in the morning, we don't really want it to last more than 12 hours in most cases. Um, or if we do, we want it to be very small amounts. Um, we just of course, you know, patients might be able to tolerate a little bit of stimulant and be able to sleep just fine. Other patients might have a really big problem with that. So you might have to go with, uh, with short acting and kind of bridge people. So maybe you give, like, instead of giving a long acting drug that's going like this, or like here's some of these biphasic release medications. So like where's Concerta on here? Uh, here's the triangles. So you see Concerta gets a bit of a burst right away when that osmotic uh, action takes place and you get sort of that short acting burst. And then you get a bit of a steady state and then another wave where the long acting medication kicks in and it slowly kind of wears off. It's a pretty long acting drug. Um, what you could consider doing, and they don't have this on here because these are all different long acting types, but like if you gave a, a short acting stimulant, just like methylphenidate, regular release, what you might see is an initial peak like this and then kind of a tapering off maybe at the four hour mark. What you could do then is dose another one. So maybe the, the child takes one before they, or the adult or child, whatever we're talking about, doesn't matter. Um, if they take a, a medication before work or school, you get a burst. And then maybe at lunchtime, they take another one to kind of continue that effect. But by the time they get home, that wears off. So um, the question is, you know, do you take another dose at home? Maybe you have to get some, maybe you have to study and you can't focus without the medication or you have a hard time um, completing tasks at home without it. So maybe you take one more dose and then by the time you're going to bed, hopefully it's worn off a substantial amount. So that's a pretty common way to do it too, is just like regular release three times a day, although that is three times a day. So what these medications are trying to mimic is essentially let's replace that three times a day dosing and give somebody something they can take once a day that does essentially the same thing. So you have very standard extended release products here that are really having uh, a very you know normal effect just prolonged. So whereas an immediate release would kind of be like a, a quick burst and then you're at four hours, you're pretty much gone because um, the half-lives are relatively short on these medications. If you extend the release of them using a different mechanism, you have you know a lot of different creative ways you can you can do it here. And you can see there's a number of ways. Essentially it all amounts to, to really the same thing. And of course you can dose up. So like concert to 18 milligrams, you like say, well that blood concentration is way lower than you know the riddle and long acting. Well you could give concert of 56 milligrams or 36 or whatever. There, there's 36 and I think 54 is the other one. So 36, you know, you're gonna double that. So of course it's all about dose too. So keep that in mind if you're looking at this curve and saying, well, why is that one much more, you know, have have much of have a huge area under the curve, you know, compared to the concerta? Well, that's the major reason is is you know, you got a few more milligrams here. And also it does taper off a bit more fat, uh, a bit more abruptly than your Concerta would, which has a bit more of a slow, less pronounced peak. 
and, uh, and a more steady state release there. So again, a number of ways you can try it. There's no right answer here. Um, I think people like Concerta. That's one I see that's prescribed very frequently. So I don't know if, you know, anecdotally people, practitioners are finding they get really good response from, from prescribing Concerta. Uh, you know, I don't really have any evidence to back that up, but I think any of these are fine. And I've definitely seen all of them. We do do, again, at Abbott, like I said, we do a lot of psych, including pediatric and adolescent psych. And I've seen pretty much all of these formulations. So there's not one that sticks out in my mind as being better. However, Concerta as a release mechanism does seem to be quite a popular choice for uh, providers to prescribe. Uh, so that's methylphenidate, you know, methylphenidate being or the Ritalins and, and whatnot being the, the more um, probably one of the most popular groups of stimulants. However, these other ones are all widely used too. So you have the Focalins branded, which are dexmethylphenidate. So very similar, but just a slightly different, uh, slightly different in antiomer. You have dextroamphetamine, which would be dexedrine or dex, dextrostat, I guess. Um, there's some long acting forms of that as well. Uh, I think Focalin products, yeah, Focalin products are still brand name only, so you can't get this one generic. So it's going to be a bit more expensive. Whereas, like, I think almost all the methylphenidates, including Concerta, are generic now. Now, there's some debate over these formulations, specifically Concerta, because Concerta has gone generic. However, there was something that came out that said, I think the company that made Concerta was saying, well, our product is a proprietary release mechanism. So you can't, this, this generic company that's making this isn't necessarily making exactly the same thing because they can't, they don't know how we're actually doing this, this osmotic release in the capsule specifically. And so there's this big controversy over like, well, is it generic or isn't it? And the generic product is still on the market, but our hospital did have something that came up a while ago where if we had people on Concerta, we had to actually review uh, with the provider to make sure that they were okay with that. And it ended up going through, it's, it's all it's all good now, so we do use the generic, but there is some controversy. So just the point is, is that when you get into these complicated release mechanisms, um, it makes things a little bit more challenging when it comes to patents and um, whether the drug can stand patent or not. Uh, Adderall products are this an amphetamine mixed salt, which is usually a combination of dextroamphetamine and just uh, plain amphetamine. So there's a couple different amphetamine forms in there, and they've apparently come up with this proprietary mix that makes it so it's, you know, I don't know, a, a, a good mix of the stimulant. I don't know, maybe longer acting, some shorter acting, whatever it may be. Um, but Adderall is generic, and it comes as a regular release and also as an extended release. So the extended release capsules... Um, I have these little beads in them that release over time, and it's not anything fancy like Concerta, but it is just pretty much just an extended release product. Adderall is super popular too. All of the Adderall products, especially XR, is, is highly popular. The XR seems to be a good balance as far as the kinetic profile goes to take it in the morning and it's pretty much off by the evening, so people tend to get a really good response from it, and then by the time they don't want it in their system anymore, it's gone. Um, and you know, if you wanted to give somebody an extended release Adderall, during the day, and then again, you could try maybe a little bit of a bump of a regular release at night if you want to continue the effect, but not carry it through into the bedtime hours. Um, and then there's Listix amphetamine, which is a really popular medication as well. It's called Vyvanse. It's a brand name one as well, so it's more expensive, and it's a long-acting product. So Vyvanse, I, I'm not exactly sure if, if the kinetic profile, people find it better than um, some of the other medications out there, but it is a really popular choice, especially for kids. I see it prescribed a lot for our pediatric populations. All right, uh, so side effects, I talked about these being really well tolerated, and they are. Um, and usually with kids, you, you hardly even see any of these, especially the CV side effects. But with adults, this is where you could get some concern. So anybody who has underlying cardiovascular issues, hypertension, um, arrhythmias, probably people you're going to want to be cautious with, and, and if not, maybe totally avoid stimulants in. Uh, but you would want to monitor. So if somebody didn't have any issues, just get a baseline blood pressure, check their heart rate, make sure there's no history of cardiac disease. Uh, interestingly enough, though, in addition to causing some increases in effects, there's also been <clears throat> some correlation between um, uh, protective effects in children, actually, with sudden cardiac death. So for kids who have maybe a family history 
of like hereditary cardiomyopathy where, you know, you have the 16 year old who collapses during the middle of a soccer game. Um, that actually has been shown maybe to um, be prevented in some cases by stimulants. So it's kind of an interesting side note there. <clears throat> Uh, neurologic and psychiatric, so sleep disturbances, of course, we talked about this. Um, however, ADHD as a disease can cause sleep disturbances as well, so sometimes it's difficult to know if it's the drug or the disease. Um, appetite suppression, very common with um, amphetamine-based stimulants. Um, so if you have, a ch for children especially, it's something that we need to make sure uh, we're watching, uh, especially for growth, and we'll talk about growth here in a second. Uh, tick development is something that can happen, and abuse potential as well. So these drugs are controlled too, which means that that's the highest level the government will or the DEA will give a medication as far as a controlled substance without saying it's totally medically unnecessary. So these are controlled too, meaning they have the highest potential for abuse. So people abuse these for a number of different reasons, and we'll talk about this just a, a little bit here in a second. And uh, priapism is a, a somewhat common thing, not not common per se, but common compared to other medications for uh, males of all ages. It is still a rare incidence, but kind of think of it like trazodone. We talked about priapism and trazodone. It is something to, to be aware of that, you know, if you, that happens to what to do and what to do in those situations. All right, other stimulant pearls. We have uh, a number of options you can do for dosing. We talked about the formulations. However, you can also do a lot of as needed too. So some people may just have a little bit of regular release stimulant on hand to take, you know, if they need to to complete a task or complete a deadline, or maybe uh, maybe they're fine during the day, but once you know at work or at school or whatever they can focus and, and they do well, and then once they get home, it's kind of like everything unravels and they can't prioritize, they can't get their homework done, they can't you know do their family obligations or whatever it may be, you have um, the option to take as needed stimulants. So there's a lot of questions about this. And is that appropriate prescribing? Um, I think it's done a lot. So I don't know. I think it comes down to the patient specific situation. Some patients might need daily stimulant. Other patients may have milder cases where they actually do quite well throughout the day again. And then, or maybe they don't, maybe it's early in the morning or in the afternoon, they have problems. You know, you, you can use your imagination to figure out what might be uh, a clinical situation where PRN is useful. The other thing that's really common is like what I was alluding to earlier, where people take a long acting medication in the morning and then they might have an as needed, you know, dose that they can take in the evening if they choose to do so. Uh, with kids, especially drug holidays are really common. And the reason is, is that uh, growth, well, first of all, the children generally don't need the medication as much during like a summer vacation. So it might be nice just to be off the medication for a little bit. And one of the issues that we do see in kids is growth retardation. So um, it's not thought to be severe. You usually have diminishing effects over time. So the older the child is, the longer they've taken it, they aren't going to see it. So maybe you might see it more so, for example, like in a 12 year old um, compared to his or her peers versus like a 16 year old might not have as pronounced of an effect. Um, the child's growth will catch up over time. So the drug holidays can allow um, that to happen a little bit. And uh, also you might see um, just over time if they, if they, you know, if they've taken it since they're 12 and now they're 20, everything should kind of catch up. And so again, it's some initial growth retardation, but it's not something that we see as a long-term side effect or something that's terribly problematic. Uh, withdrawal. So if you stop the medication, it's usually kind of mild. Um, it really depends on the formulation and how high the dose was, uh, but it could cause some rebound ADHD type symptoms. And that's really it. It's not going to generally affect people too much. Um, we, we talk about these medications, stimulants and amphetamines. And the key really to remember is that we're talking about, you know, very controlled doses, very small amounts, unless you're using a lot of stimulant or amphetamine. You shouldn't have a huge amount of side effects or a huge amount of withdrawal if you stop it, uh, you know, suddenly. Okay, uh, moving on to some other drugs. Uh, Adamoxetine or Stratera is a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So it's kind of like our antidepressants, but um, specifically used for ADHD. It's a non-addictive, non-controlled, non-stimulant version. Um, and it is clinically effective. However, it's not uh, clinically as good as stimulants. It's also brand name only. It can be quite expensive. Uh, what we see with this, uh, as far as adverse effects, are sort of all over the board. So you get anywhere from fatigue to insomnia, which are sort of opposite. Um, dry mouth, it's a little bit anticholinergic. 
um, just like with uh, with our serotonin um, reuptake inhibitors, we do see some sexual side effects. So you might have some erectile dysfunction with this for men. Um, anything that seems to affect norepinephrine in the brain tends to seem to be uh, at risk for priapism. So just like stimulants, you have that, but rare. Um, hepatotoxicity is also a side effect, but also quite rare. And you do have CV side effects, kind of like you would with stimulants, although to a much less degree. So hypertension, palpitations. It is a, it's, it's a norepinephrine agent, so you do get those, you know, peripheral effects with it to a certain degree. Um, antidepressants are, are useful specifically for adults. Adults oftentimes will be managed um, sometimes with just antidepressants alone. They might actually try an antidepressant first and skip the stimulant. Um, just because adults tend to seem to have a different overall presentation of ADD, and sometimes the antidepressants can be more effective by themselves than, than a stimulant might be. So uh, tricyclic antidepressants are actually pretty well studied for this. Um, Desipramine and nortriptyline specifically. So we talked about tricyclics and not how they, we don't really like them for depression per se. This is some place we might see them, them working, and it, it could be a really good option for somebody who's having some ADD symptoms and isn't uh, getting a lot of sleep, this could be something that they could try because uh, it's going to be sedating. They can take it in the evening, but it is going to take some time to respond. A stimulant, like uh, an amphetamine stimulant, you're pretty much going to see a response right away. Tricyclics, you, you kind of fall into that you know, antidepressant uh, onset of action where you have several weeks before you're going to see a full effect there. Uh, bupropion is a um, one of our antidepressants. It's a bit more stimulant like than a TCA so it focuses on dopamine uh, it isn't sedating at all and it does seem to work a bit quicker uh, for, for clinical evidence so that's an option too um, MAOIs uh, you know these are last line for depression it would be last line here too uh, response is variable however they are they are studied and have shown benefit in some cases and then SSRIs and SNRIs are usually adjunct and usually SNRIs tend to have a better response to an antidepressant. So it's it's really common for an adult with ADD or ADHD to be on a, a you know an like an amphetamine stimulant um, plus like an SSRI because there is usually a depressed there seems to be a depressive component or if there isn't the SSRI or SNRI seems to augment the uh, the the action of the stimulant. So it's not uncommon to see that that combination done, but if you were treating somebody for this and you wanted to try something non-stimulant, this is sort of the options uh, you want to try for an adult patient. With Stratera kind of falling in the middle, maybe considering that one as well. And you have alpha-2 agonists, so central acting alpha-2 agonists. Uh, guanfacine is the drug that's used mostly in children. Uh, the, the efficacy for it in adults is very questionable, and it's not really used all that often. But uh, it's shown to be very beneficial in children with aggressive behavior or significant hyperactivity. And uh, it does cause some sedation, though, compared to, you know, our stimulants, which, of course, don't do that, and dizziness. So, again, if your child is very hyperactive, very aggressive, this could be an option that's that's good. Uh, there's two brand names, Tenex and Intuniv. Intuniv is a extended release formulations. Tenex, uh, you have to take or regular release guanfacine, you have to take several times a day. Really, these drugs are very similar to the antihypertensive medication clonidine, although they don't really cause too many, like guanfacine alone doesn't really cause a lot of issues with um, and blood pressure, although you might get some with the, with the dizziness side effects, some orthostatic hypotension. Clonidine um, could be used theoretically as well. So if you have an adult with um, hypertension and ADHD, that could be an option for them simply because you, you generally don't want to use stimulants. You probably don't want to use um, Stratera. might cause a little bit more you know, effect on the, the circulatory system than you want. Uh, so clonidine could be an option at least to try, and it might help with some of the ADHD symptoms as well. All right, stimulant abuse. So this is a, a, a great question. It's a big topic to, to just put a couple of slides on. But you have uh, a Schedule II drug. So you have prescription limitations on it. However, there are some, um, usually for a Schedule II medication, you can't do more than a month supply, but there are some cases where people can get 90-day supplies with these because they are, for, for children especially or young adults, they can be a chronic medication, and it's just challenging for somebody to, to remember every month to get a prescription filled. So 90 days is possible. 
um, you know, I don't probably need to say this, but college and high school student abuse is rampant. So, and it's not necessarily illicitly acquiring the medication, although that does happen for sure. Um, people just tend to seek these medications out. And for whatever reason, they, they tend to be pretty easy to get. I think there's a lot of controversy over these drugs because they're relatively safe. And um, if somebody's having difficulty in school, it, it can be a, a situation where the, the student says, well, you know, my friends take these medications and they do better than me. So don't I get deserve to get the same opportunity as them? And of course, that's a huge ethical debate that I'm not going to get into. But, um, you know, performing arts and athletics, there's benefits there for um, stimulants. There's a lot of banned stimulants, even legal stimulants like, uh, you know, amphetamine, unless you have a, a, a doctor, you know, a signed note or something or a medical reason to be on them. There's a lot of sports regulatory organizations that ban them. Um, so uh, stimulants, we, we think about stimulants if you're thinking about like drugs of abuse. Um, you usually have a much slower release. So like cocaine and methamphetamine, we're going to talk about during the drugs abuse lecture, but they do actually work very similarly. Um, but uh, the, the oral release mechanisms and just taking an oral medication, a stimulant orally, isn't usually enough to produce, you know, kind of like a, a rush or a high, like a, a drug of abuse. What if you snorted or injected something? However, you, know, you can... People do abuse these by crushing them and snorting them and injecting them. I don't know if people smoke them. I'm sure people have tried to. I don't know if that works or not. Uh, but the point is, is that you can abuse these for sure if you, if you want to in that way. Um, I think the more controversial or more interesting discussion is about, you know, the, the prescribing practices of these and, you know, should people be able to, to access these? Is this like a, a smart, you know, does this make you smarter? <laughs> you know, are you, are you bringing yourself up to the level of your peers by taking this if everybody else is? So, that's, I think, the more interesting conversation, which, again, I'm not going to get into much more than, than that. Um, if somebody is at a high risk for abuse, uh, you know, if they have a history of abuse or any type of substance abuse, I'd recommend steering clear of stimulants. Try Stratera. Um, try maybe a tricyclic antidepressant or a different type of antidepressant. Um, the question is, you know, if you have a patient who doesn't necessarily have diagnosed ADHD, and this sort of on the same lines as the as the conversation about you know, should people be taking this just to study uh, the 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 thing to think about is that well if you took a stimulant and you don't have the actual ADHD aren't you just going to feel like you know you're, you're kind of wired is it going to be all that effective for you and they've actually done some studies on this for people who don't actually have ADHD to see what kind of responses they get and they've come up with a, a bit of a mixed bag so um, do you get so the question is do you, do you have some kind of neurochemical imbalance to get positive clinical effects from a stimulant well some people say yes and theoretically stimulants will make someone who does not have the symptom just energetic and hyperactive so kind of counter productive for what you're going to do. Yeah, hyperactivity and energy might not necessarily go hand in hand with getting work done and, and studying. Um, and no, no people who say no would say many people without the disease seem to actually clinically actually show that they have to be have successful results. They can perform better on exams. They get improved cognitive benefits with the medication. So question is, you know, is, I think there's me. Are some of these people who are seeking out the medication illicitly? Is that sort of a you know, an undiagnosed ADHD? Is that because they just never got diagnosed and they should be? And there's a ton of questions you could ask yourself. But again, I think it's a really interesting topic of discussion. Okay, so um, if, you, if you're treating anyone with ADHD initially, with no history of drug abuse, you're usually going to go to a stimulant, whether they're an adult or a child, probably going to try a stimulant. Um, if it doesn't work, um, you know, you can you can play with your formulations. I would try maybe some alternate long-acting ones. You know, think, think about again, like I was hinting at, when you need to provide the stimulant for the patient. So when's the patient most need uh, to to be able to focus during the day? Are they having issues at work? Are they having issues at home? Are they having both? Uh, that's where you'd look at your formulations and try and find something that might work for the patient. Um, history of abuse. You could probably put in also like um, for adults. You know. Cardiovascular issues, um, tricyclic antidepressants, atomoxetine could be okay. Uh, clonidine for patients with hypertension, guanfacine for kids, uh, are other things you could try. And you can add these on. So you could be on a stimulant plus, you know, I don't usually see stimulants in Sorterra combined, but I think you technically could. 
Um, I probably shouldn't say that without actually looking it up, but um, I, it's a rare thing. Usually they're on one or the other, but you could combine like a TCA with a stimulant. You could combine guanfacine with a stimulant for a kid. Um, clonidine uh, could be given for an adult and combined with like an antidepressant. So there's a number of different ways you could do it. And if you're not responding really, I'd try maybe a different stimulant. Try, you know, if you're on uh, methylphenidate, try like Adderall or the mixed amphetamines. Try dexedrine. Try something else. Um, combine your classes. You know, try the antidepressant, especially for adults. Remember that that antidepressant has been shown to be pretty effective when you add it in conjunction with stimulants. So, so don't forget about that completely. Um, even if the patient doesn't have clinical depression, the antidepressant on its own and with stimulants does seem to have a, a decent effect for this disorder. So um, that's all I've got for ADD. Uh, we'll finish this series of lectures with uh, um, some anxiety and we'll talk a little bit about alcohol abuse as well.